I'm Christy Myers and welcome to this month's Miniger Clinic Facebook Live. Today we're talking about supporting loved ones who have a mental illness. Now it may surprise you to learn that mental illness is very common in the United States. An estimated 54 million people have some type of mental disorder. And these can be anything from anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar, dementia, or other things. In fact, there are 200 types of mental illness. With treatment and family support, many people with mental illness can live a productive life, but that's not the case for everyone. And there's a toll, not just on the person struggling with mental illness, but on the family as well. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Jim and Kate Likes. We are who are here to help these families. You have been the support for two family members with a mental illness. Jim, your father had bipolar disorder, and you have a daughter who was misdiagnosed and mistreated with the incorrect mental illness. So we want to welcome you and thank you for sharing your story and your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. The first question, Jim, is as a child, how did your father's mental disorder affect you and the other kids? It was something that we tried to keep just normalcy in the family. And so for the most part, yeah, he was on his medicine and, and uh, life was normal. You know, he was a physician and uh, did extremely well. Uh, but it's really about the only time we ever saw, you know, difference was when he you know, had gotten off his medicine. And, and you know, it was often, I think a lot of people got off it because of the uh, fear of, you know, the medicine affecting their memory, you know, being a doctor. That was an integral part of, you know, what he did. And, and uh, so there were, there were times when he would get off his medicine or he just didn't feel like he needed it. Uh, and you would see, you know, the symptoms of, of uh, bipolar you know, come out at the time. We, we called it manic depressive back then, so always have to you know, think about it. But but growing up, you know, it was manic depressive. And so we, we definitely, you know, got to see, you know, the, the dramatic swings of highs and lows, you know, things like that. For the most part, we just had a, a normal life and, and we went into, you know, the, the mode when, you know, our father got off the medicine. You know, we kind of did what we needed to do. The hard thing for us was uh, we didn't talk about outside the family. And uh, so that, that was the difference. Uh, we, we talked with I guess, two little brothers. We talked internally. My mother was incredible with what she did, but the fear back then, you know, 30, 40 years ago was you don't talk about mental health because people didn't understand it and would think that uh, you're crazy. And uh, being a physician, you know, in a smaller town, you know, we really couldn't afford to let that information get out. Yeah, you had this full circle with your daughter being diagnosed or actually misdiagnosed. Kate, can you tell us what were the symptoms that you first noticed that caused you both to think our daughter may have something more than a teenage rebellion? Uh, fantastic question. We were just talking about this this week about how do you recognize the difference between typical teenage behavior and something more serious. And there are, I think, two of many, but two very significant signals, that, and we had both, and one is a lack of interest in life. And when there's no fear of death, there's really no interest in life, that's one, that's one very scary signal. And another one is completely disruptive to their life. They, they no longer can go to school. They're no longer interested in their friends. So when they are make their own choices, are very disruptive to what what has historically made them happy. Those were two very big things. Yeah, the, the other one I remember uh, at the very beginning with Peyton was she she would just she'd come home and she I just can't concentrate in, in class. I just can't I can't concentrate on what the teacher's saying. And I think that was you know, an early signal for us that we really need to be more aware of what's going on with her. The thing is, you were both listening. You were paying attention. So, what did you do first to get help? We took a very traditional route. We called a therapist and we had some testing done and in very short order in a 15 minute psychiatric session, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at 13. And to, it's not about the people, it's the system. I think there are extraordinarily talented doctors and therapists out there, but this system is such today that you have a 15 minute appointment. We're prescribing significant medicine that, and diagnoses that, and the diagnoses weren't individual education plans, special accommodations at school. The medications can be such that 
you can't even stay on it in certain treatment scenarios, and so that's very disruptive. So there's not there's not a thorough, comprehensive look at this child, and then on on over and over time. So what we learned is that they're really where we've come is when that wasn't working. <laughs> so we went to another doctor and we Googled and we asked around and we tried different medications and two residential treatments later and four doctors and we really et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you're, you're building education and skills along the way. And what we've really come to learn is that we need comprehensive 360 degree care. It takes the psychiatrist, the therapist, loved ones, in order to get a 300, and the, of course the patient, to get this 360 degree view of what's really going on for them and to be able to have a proper diagnosis and therefore proper treatment. You must have felt very alone because you're taking her to the doctor, you're taking her to the therapist, you're not getting good information, and where do you go? If the experts aren't answering the question, you're the parents, you're struggling at home. At some point, did you feel like we're out of options or out of ideas, what next? The scary part, is that we were, we had, I worked for a healthcare consulting firm, so I had help in finding resources, we had financial means, and we were struggling. I was Googling. One of our therapists I found on Google. It really shouldn't be, it shouldn't have to be that hard. I it, think it, was, no, it, was, it was very frustrating. You know, I think about you know, other illnesses, and you think about, say, a patient you know, who has cancer. Uh, I mean, there is a protocol, and you know where to go. But with mental health, you really don't know where to go. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know who to talk to. Uh, you know, we did. We just started you know, googling and talking to you know, people, and you know, just you know, uh, you know, after we you know, hit you know, errors or failures, we'd learn from that, and, and we would just keep going forward. Um, we we never felt like you know, we were up against the wall and we couldn't do anything anymore. We we knew we were challenged, uh, but I think we always you know, we we go to bed at night trying to think you know of what our next step was going to be. And you know, wake up the next day and you know, perform it. And if we failed, we go to bed the next night and think about you know a new way of trying to solve the problem. But we still we, do that. Yeah, and we, <laughs> and we you know, and so we. I mean, it took you know years to educate ourselves, but um, but there's there's not a good system you know to really help out. And you you have to kind of put it together yourself, and that's what we end up doing over time. You know, our families out there. There are many families out there that are in this in process with the beginning. And if they have questions now, we'd like to give you the opportunity. Anybody on Facebook that's seeing this on our Facebook Live today, and if you're dealing with a similar situation, you can send your question for Kate and Jim Likes and get this question into us now so that they can help you answer the questions and we'll answer as many questions for our Facebook viewers as we can. Because this is a wonderful opportunity for them to perhaps skip some of these difficult steps as you're going out there. And I know it's so frustrating when you think, I've done the right thing, this doctor's wrong. How long do you think it took for you to kind of, to get back to equilibrium after your daughter had the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment for, was it close to a year? It was close to a year. Mm -hmm. it, it took her being in such danger that she went to a wilderness program and it was there that we got a thorough diagnosis and one that was longer than a one and a half page questionnaire where we got a thorough diagnosis mm -hmm. and we really got a team together to start to, to to hone in on a correct diagnosis. So what could other parents do? How do they know that a diagnosis is so wrong? I guess it took you a few months to figure out she was worse. She got worse after you take her to a psychiatrist, you think you've done the right thing, and now she's worse. At what point should other parents say, this is a red flag, this isn't working, I need to do something different? I think the doctors in the, the doctors particularly when it came to medication are, are very clear about this should take two weeks, this should take six weeks, let's revisit this within um, an XYZ period of time. But often in the current system, it's here's a medication, it should work in about two weeks, come back in three months. And I think what, what yeah, we've we're, learned- We're talking life and death a lot of times. You can't wait three months. It, you, oh, know, no. it's, you know, it's one thing it's a cold, but we're, we're talking about you know, the life of a child. And to uh, you have a consultation of 15 minutes and you have two or three prescriptions and come back in three months, as parents, you're going, are you serious? 
th this is this is the system we're dealing with, um, and I think that's what bothers me so much because it, I mean it literally is a life or death situation, and so you know we we kept pushing uh, you know, on it, and you know, your question is you know, how, how do you, how did we know she she was misdiagnosed? I honestly I don't know the answer to that. We just knew that she wasn't herself, and you know we kept looking for answers. Now, you have to also take in mind this is a this is a 13 year old girl that you know her hormones are changing you know, so her, her body is changing as well as everything else and so it, it is so hard to stay on top of it because not only is it you know the, the mental health aspect of it but then it's also just you know nature you know, taking its course and, and so it's a challenge it was, it was a challenge for us so back to parents I would say if things aren't changing and someone has said, if things aren't changing, keep that conversation alive. Don't wait for that three months. Yeah. Don't wait for even the, the, the therapist appointment next week. Don't wait. S stay aggressive. Yeah. That's it. Stay aggressive because this is your child and it's her life. Now, how did you eventually find the right diagnosis and the right treatment? Go ahead. Um, so we, we got a thorough evaluation both at 13, but there are several things that because of their teenage hormones, uh, it's preferred to wait until they're older, so we did it again, kind of rounded it out when she was 17. And that is when several years of experience and a formal, lengthy diagnosis really all pointed to her diagnosis and the treatment for that has seemed to help. And I think all those together, when the factors make sense, treatment starts to work. That's how you know you've got the right diagnosis and the right treatment. It, and yeah, the, the, when she did the testing at, at 17, you know, we talked to friends, we all started talking, and that, that was the one thing I learned you know, from you know, growing up, not talking outside the family, that we're gonna talk about it, and we're, we're gonna talk to other people about it. You know, we're not too proud to you know, talk about this situation because it's so you know, prevalent out there. And um, but for us, you know, we talked to somebody who a doctor really helped, uh, you know, them with their family, and so we, we called up the doctor Norma Clark, if I can say the name, but you know Norma Clark, and she was you know, phenomenal, and so we went up and you know met with her, and she was just you know, spot on with you know, what was going on with her daughter. Uh, you know, we eventually had her tested, and which confirmed uh, the results. You know, when she was 13, which was great, and, and that really you know helped us you know, continue the plan for our daughter. All right piggyback on talking. Jim and I have never been afraid to talk, and here's why. In a life and death circumstance, if something happened to our daughter, would we ever look up and say, we never wanted to look up and say, wish we had, yeah. wish, wish we'd asked, yeah. wish we'd talked. Yeah. It's I not about us, it's about, about her life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I truly enjoy, there's not a day that goes by that uh, somebody doesn't talk to us about you know, uh, themselves, a family member, a friend, uh, you know, who has who's struggling, you know, with depression or mental health, or um, and we love talking to them. Just we don't have the answers, but we just explore them. Does that surprise you when you were open, and so few people are, and then people start coming to you? Does that does that really stun you that people? They're desperate for help, and they're they're coming to talk to you. You've become the expert. You're the parent, <laughs> and now you're the expert. That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> but you are in terms of caregiving and how you did it and what you need to do as a caregiver because you've walked this road for five years. You really are. Well, we can be supportive, you know, and I think that's what we try to do. You know, we give you know, suggestions to people. We support them and let them know they're not alone. You know, with it, uh, we don't have all the answers. We don't have you know, a lot of answers, but you know, what we can do is you know, give them suggestions on how they might be able to handle the situation. We have a Facebook viewer here named Russell, and he asked an interesting question. What issues as a couple did you have in dealing with your daughter, and how did you work on those issues? Can I have this one? Yeah. <laughs> I was actually just thinking about this as Jim was talking, so great question, Russell. Um, it is obviously very, very hard on other siblings, it's very, very hard on a marriage. Jim and I decided, it was a conscious decision from minute one, that this was going to be hard enough as it was, and we had to have a unified front. That 
we had to be in this together. And so if we, we often don't necessarily want to handle things the same way at the same time. So we wait, we talk, we vet until we get on the same page. And when we get on the same page is when we, is when we approach Peyton with, if this, then that, or how about this? Sometimes circumstances are such that you, you can't wait till you're on right. the same page. You're going to have that conversation with a loved one or you're going to have to take action. action. Something happens and you have to take action. And that's what makes it still really hard. Those things do happen. But I think it starts and ends with this commitment of not wanting to be divided because then you can't ever, a, a, a loved one will consciously or not manipulate that and so how important it is for our marriage for the sake of us and our relationship for the sake of our whole family and for the child that our marriage has to come first and then we use that strength yeah it's, it's something others. we really you know focus on with you know with, with me working you know, I come home and it's, it's almost all consumed a lot of times it's yeah you know, we have three other kids you know, uh, you know Peyton's the oldest and, and three younger kids and we try to keep you know, the normalcy in the family as, as much as possible, but we also are spending a lot of time, you know, with our daughter uh, through the situation. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's challenging. You know, we, we want to be able to talk about other things, and but it's a very, you know, important situation, and you know, we only have a certain amount of time during the day to talk about it. We talk about it, but, but we also want to spend that time and show attention to the other kids and let them know that this might be going on, you know, with your sister, but we want you to continue living you know, the one, you know, hopefully the wonderful life they have. So, Has their impact so far, are they kind of together understanding that Peyton has some problems but we still love her and that we're not holding against mom and dad if they don't have time for us tonight or if there's a week that's a tough week. How Do they generally understand what you're doing? They're, like, yeah, they're younger. They're, yeah. I think they're amazing. They're, they're fantastic. They've been great. Uh, I think Kate and I have you know, uh, made the decision that we're going to be open about you know, what's going on and, and so we, we do talk to the kids about it. You know, if there's uh, you know an incident that you know is happening, we can sit the kids down and talk to them and uh, let them know you know we're a family and you know, we stick together and work together. And uh, this might be a situation you know Peyton right now, but you know a year from now it might be a situation that we have to show you know, more attention to you. But that's just what we do as a family. And we're open about where we are at any given time. This is how mom is feeling, and we invite them to do the same, and they do. It's okay to say, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. I know, Mom and Dad, that you're doing the best you can, but yeah. I'm mad about it today, but that's okay. Yeah. Did they ever say that unsolicited sometime, come up and say, hey, I'm, I want you to do this today, and now this has happened with Peyton. Do they, or do, they do that, or they're just, just kind of easygoing? Just they have, like, but yeah, they're not yeah. often. They're, 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 they've always been pretty supportive, but, but, it, but it has happened before. Because it's just part of life where you... I've done it. <laughs> so, I mean, we all do. Um, but uh, but they, they're wonderful. And they love their sister very much. And they've been extremely supportive uh, of, of her. But she's also been very supportive of them. So. Right. And it's quite different than anything else happening in life. You might have a car accident and cancel a lunch plan. We might have to address flying Peyton home. So we're not having a play date. You know, it's just we all, whether it's something related to mental health or a car accident or, you know, we all have disruptive moments. And so they're, they're good at recognizing that sometimes we have disruptive moments. So what kind of treatment is she getting now that you think is, is a great improvement on the parents? Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think what is different now than she's ever had before, one, she has the, she has the right fit for her. There's a, there's a cultural connection. She has that. But I also think it's 350. She is 18, so there is, one, there's doctor-patient or you know, provider-patient privilege, regardless of age, which we respect. But particularly when you're over 18, uh, you can still be paying for all this and, sit and be completely left in the dark, which is a particularly frustrating position in which to be. But what, what we have enabled is a, a 360 team so that 
she signed releases for them to talk to each other. So even if she doesn't want mom and dad to be involved, she recognizes, okay, I appreciate this person's help and this person's help. They can talk to each other. And together, there is, there's momentum behind recommended care, recommended next steps, and that has been an absolute game changer for us. Yeah, and she's, yeah, she's you know, done the uh, IOP, which is the you know, intensive outpatient program, uh, you know, which helps you know, with you know, DBT skills, which helps her manage uh, you know, the borderline personality disorder. Uh, you know, she's been you know, part of the APG, which is alternative, alternative care, care group. group. And uh, so you know, we, we try to keep her busy, uh, and she stays busy with uh, you know, her friends uh, doing things, because you know, what we find is the toughest time you know, with Peyton's late at night. You know, she uh, she doesn't sleep as, as much as you know, some people do, but you know, late at night you, know, you start surfing you know, the internet and you, know, you start to, you know, doing things that or thinking of things that you typically don't do during the day. So well, we try to keep her busy. And it's easy to get into this cycle, especially being in such an, uh, a large metropolitan area. It's easy to get into this cycle where we stay up late and we watch Netflix and then we don't sleep well and then we're tired and then we don't eat very well and so then we don't exercise very well so then we're not in the mood we isolate and we're not in the mood to talk so then we watch Netflix etc etc I call it the night cycle we've all done that at one point or the other you stay up too late you don't feel but I'd like to ask you now why are you guys willing to share your story now it is a hard story was there just something that just you felt like people need to hear they need to understand uh, what it's like as a family supporting someone with a mental disability I, I do it because I don't want other families to go through what we're going to go through I mean I think it was you know four or five years of you know searching and trying to find you know what was wrong and how we could help and everything else and and, and we did feel alone, you know, oftentimes. Didn't know where to go, but we, we kept pushing. But we didn't know where to go, we didn't know what to do. You know, we had frustrations with the insurance companies, we had frustrations with the doctors. Um, and again, it's a life or death situation. This isn't, I mean, it, it, was, it was very serious. And, and to, you know, watch somebody that you love, you know, in so much pain, uh, you, you wanna do something. And I don't wanna see other families go through what we had to. Um, I don't know how we can help sometimes, but you know, what we can do is you know, share our story, um, hopefully give them some ideas to get help for themselves or a loved one. And I would say when one in five people have mental illness in this country, and the average family size is 4.2, virtually every family is impacted. And if you're not, someone you know and care about is impacted. And if we can, if we can just be talking about this and realize how important it is to take care of your, your own health so that you have the strength, you don't go down that cycle, so that your, your marriage is healthy and you're healthy, you can, you can talk about it. And I would, and we've learned over the past several months that the calls keep coming in. We don't know where to go, we don't know what to do, and it just shouldn't have to be this hard, and we were there, as Jen said, we don't want it to, we don't want it to have to be this hard, I always joke that I went to the Kate, Kate Life School of Neuroscience, AKA my kitchen table, <laughs> drawing a picture of trying to figure out my, my, the common denominators in my daughter's way of thinking. It just shouldn't have to be this hard. The technology's there. Menninger has got one of the largest databases, 4,000 patients with brain images and evidence-based treatment. The technology is there. It's just not accessible between awareness, education, finances. It's, we just need to help. So we need to help each other. And we went through a long phase where, who are we? We're still trying to figure this out. We clearly don't have, we're clearly not completely on the other side of this and we're not credential, but we realized that we were helping each other. We were helping friends. Let's, let's keep talking. It's important to talk about it. And, and uh, you know, part of what Kate and I have done is, you know, we're on the board of you know, Project 375 you know, which is, you know, their goal is to eradicate the stigma of, of mental health. And so we talk about it, you know, openly. We want other people to feel comfortable talking about it as well. Because the more people that talk about it, the more attention that goes to it, the more money for research, the more, you know, research, we, you know, we can help more people. And the more objective the treatment protocol becomes, and therefore the more, more likely it will to be covered. 
So how did the technology, do you think, impact uh, the diagnosis for Peyton? Uh, how did uh, Miniger's technology help? I don't think that we have, I think the technology is there. We weren't, we were not Beneficiary beneficiaries of that. Of that. And that's part of why we love being involved with, with Miniger is because we think that everybody should have access to that. I think if we had, we wouldn't be at our kitchen tables trying to make sure things out. Is this it? Yeah. <laughs> we would have the brain scan. And if we can get the help sooner, if we can get the diagnosis and the proper protocol treatment sooner, then not only are you helping that family sooner, but you're also reducing the collateral hurt. It's happening in the meantime, meantime while you're trying to fix, while you're trying to put together this puzzle without a box out. For a lot of people, four or five years is, a, unfortunately, the, the, the person could commit suicide in that time. And so it took us four or five years to really educate ourselves, and, and we were fortunate that uh, you know, th things have worked out with our daughter. But for some people, they don't have that you know, time. They don't have four or five years to educate themselves to really help somebody. I mean, it, it could be life or death you know, the next day. And if you're one of our Facebook viewers who has a loved one in this situation, perhaps you are, please send in your question because the likes are here. We have a few more minutes to answer those questions. And one thing I'd like to ask you is, what do you tell families who have a loved one who's not receptive to, to help and support? They need it, but they're not receptive. I think it kind of depends on the age of the, the person because you know, under 18 years old, you, you know, as a parent, you have a little more control. Uh, you know, 18 and above, it, it becomes more challenging. Um, I think what I would, would tell parents is you just you have to you have to stick with it. You know, have faith, be strong, you know, work together. Um, I don't know how you convince you know a, a child. I mean, that's a that's a difficult question. Uh, I have to say, I don't, I don't know. I would think that... Just don't give up. Yeah. Just don't that's give right. up. That's right. Yeah. And I would think if if someone needs help, I'm going to go <laughs> gonna take this chance and say they're probably not happy. They're not thriving. I think we all want to live a life worth living. And I think just to ask, what, what makes you smile? Just get to know a person. Get to know that person, whether it's a friend or a parent or a child or whatever the age, and try if you can help them see that what they're doing isn't working for them. Again, it's not your it's not your life, it's not your choices, but if what they're doing isn't working for them, and maybe help them come to that place on their own of what they might be able to do with your help. To help let them know that they've got help to do that. Because I think we have also found when people get stuck, it's because they don't know what to do next. Okay, I'm here to help you. Let's just talk about what you need. We'll worry about how late. What do you need? And if they're willing to be helped, then I think you can you can help connect them with it. The uh, they talk about how family members can be supportive without enabling inappropriate behavior. That's got to be a problem too, because so often the person with a mental health problem becomes dependent. And the family has to step in and do more and more for them. That's kind of a difficult cycle as well. How did you handle that? How are we handling it? <laughs> How are you? Yes, in the present tense. Present tense. Right. Yeah, it, um, it, I don't even know how to answer that one. I'll give it a whirl. Yeah. These are hard um, questions. They I mean, are. These are horribly these are difficult well, questions, and I know they are. You know, you know, but it's, you know, for, for us, it's uh, it's just kind of spur of the moment. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you know, situations you know, arise, you know, we, we don't have you know all the the answers. And so when something comes up, you know, Peyton and I talk, uh, and we try to figure out you know, what the you know, the best you know, game plan is. But um, I wish we had a rule book to go by. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be nice. a time lapse how to book? Where did those go? But unfortunately, we don't. And so we, uh, you know, we you, we use what we've uh, been educated on and. I think being supportive, just to love, to let that person know that you care about them, love them unconditionally. And you can do that regardless of your actions. I don't actually have to 
buy you anything, do anything, take you anywhere just to show you that I love you. And I think in order to not enable, we have to detach, we have to let go of what we want for that person. And that becomes really, really hard as a parent. Um, I'm sure we can all remember, think back on times when our kids were little and we were frustrated because they didn't wear a dress for Easter Sunday. And then when they're older because you know, they left with their hair a mess and it's purple and maybe that's not what we had in mind or we have visions of what we want for our children but they're not our child. And so that means that sometimes failures have to happen. They have to learn for themselves. So for example, here's just one. Our Peyton is frustrated that she doesn't drive. Well, she needs to renew her driver's license. She needs to pay tickets. I could take care of that in 10 minutes. She, those, we need to let those things happen to us, let them take care of themselves. And they'll feel great for it. They will feel this sense of accomplishment and pride for it. So it's, it's a win-win in the long run. There's an interesting concept that some caregivers are using, and I know you've heard of it, help that hurts and help that helps. Are you familiar with that? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that might be interesting for people to, to, to think about when it's family member who needs their help. I think it's very akin to the last question. I think help that hurts is when you are doing things for them. Let them, help them see their own choices through, make their own choices that are right for them, and actually make, help those allow them, but allow them to, to fail or not fail, which is very hard as a parent, or even as a spouse or a sibling, but allow them to do this, I guess, after making clear what needs to be done. Yeah. And the help that helps is the encouragement. I'm gonna encourage you to do it, and these are the things we discussed that you need to do, and we'll be happy for you when you get your driver's license again. Yeah. So, for example, we live, we have an 18-year-old that finishing up high school and so all of us are looking at, all of us with 18 year olds are looking at, do we go to college? Do we take a gap year? Do we work? There are lots of options and I'm sure most parents have an idea for their children, but it's not our life, it's not our choice. And so I think help that hurts can be go to college, find a job, major in something that will find you a job that will make money so you can grow up and be independent. I'm not saying, let me rephrase that. I'm not saying that that is help that hurts. I'm saying it it can be if you are pigeonholing or doing it for them. I will finish your college application. I will make these phone calls for you versus what's in your heart? What do you need at this stage in your life? You're still so young. Who knew, how many of us knew what we wanted to be when we were in college? Yeah, we're, <coughs> we're very supportive of her, but we, we want her to make her own decisions and um, you know, relish in her achievements and, and learn from her mistakes. And I think earlier on as parents, we, uh, I know I did, you, know, you just, you love your children. And so you want to solve problems for them. But sometimes, you know, by me solving a problem, I'd really cause another problem. You know, because I'm handling a situation that our children are handling a situation. And standing back and watching is, I think, one of the hardest things a parent can do. We've had some great questions here from our Facebook viewers. From Jeanette, should families focus more on the diagnosis or symptoms when dealing with a crisis? Um, diagnosis or symptoms? I guess symptoms get yeah. you to the diagnosis. Um, I, think, I think, first of all, I think you really have to have an accurate diagnosis. Because um, I think there's a lot of overlap with uh, a lot of the mental health diseases. I think when you look at you know, bipolar compared to borderline personality disorder to you know, just you know, depression, there, there's a lot of similarities you know, with those. So I think you know, sometimes the symptoms, yeah, there's there's the overlap there. So I think to me it's it's very important for you know, somebody to have an accurate diagnosis uh, so you know how to treat it. We have another one from Nancy. What types of treatment decisions were a challenge or dilemma for your daughter and for you? I, that's a great question. I think, yeah. you know, they're, they're all difficult. You know, so, you know, Peyton, we did send her off to uh, Wilderness 
at 13, she turned 14 while she was there. That was obviously hard. You know, letting a you know, 13 year old you know, go out of your home uh, was very difficult. You know, she went to you know, resident, residential treatment center. You know, sometimes as parents, you don't, you don't know if you're doing the right thing for your child. And um, it's hard. Uh, I think you know, here, you know, going to you know, the IOPs and APGs, those are a little easier, I think, as a, a parent to send them to because they're, they're coming you know, back to the house at the end Just of the day. Just IOPs, that's the outpatient treatment. That intensive, intensive outpatient, outpatient program. Mm -hmm. And the APGs is? You know, the Alberta Peer Group. So she was dealing with a lot of group therapy. Yeah. So, um, and they're held accountable by their peers. But, but so, you know, some of the decisions you know, we have made and we're making, uh, sometimes we wonder, you know, is, is it the right decision? But you know, Kate made a wonderful point the other day when uh, you know, we you had a, a decision we needed to make and, and I just told her, I said, I don't know if we're making the right decision. And she said, but you don't know if the other decision would have been any better. I mean, there's not a right or a wrong. And, uh, and so that's, that's where we were. And, uh, but all we could do was make the decision that we thought was best for our daughter and our family not doing anything is the one wrong decision Guaranteed. if she's still in pain, right? yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Another question from Laura, what are some mistakes you're aware of that some families make when they first learn about a relative's diagnosis? I think there's a few things. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. I think we're both by chomping at the bit for that one. Uh, Go no, ahead, I, mean, please. I, I think, you know, uh, some, some families, I mean, if there, there are cultures where they uh, don't accept mental health maybe as easily. Uh, yeah, they feel like just you know the kid needs to snap out of it. Well, you can't snap. It's like telling a, a cancer patient they need to snap out of it. Um, I think that's you know one thing you know, with it. And then the the other that I see a lot of times is you're still forcing them down to the way you want them to be. And the reality is, you know, with uh, you know, these children with mental health, uh, they're they're going to have to do things a different way. It's not always you know, just the way you want. A quick, quick, same thing. No, I, had, I didn't hit the two, the two biggies, and I'll just piggyback that not only respect their decision, but not to jump in and do it for them. Also, to to take care of yourself because we we need to be strong. This is very taxing on us too, and we need to be strong for them. We need to be a resource to our loved ones. And if we're not, if we are enmeshed in what's going on for them, then we're going to be also consumed by their decisions because of the way they hurt us. And then we're also draining of our energy and we can't over support them. It can overwhelm a whole family. That was one of the important things I was gonna ask you about tips for families because the ups and down can just overwhelm you and the whole family. Are there just a rule, a rule of thumb, just for parents and how to manage ups and downs and not let it overwhelm the family? Do you have a better <laughs> Well, actually, I, I think this is a great idea, Tim. I'll say it's twofold. You said, how do you manage ups and, ups and downs? Mm -hmm. But I'd also like to speak to just how, how you live. Um, you know, I mentioned get outside, eat, sleep, move well, take care of yourself. I think that does wonders for our own, for our health as a whole. But also, spending good old-fashioned date night. So do that with your kids, do that with each other, do that with you, do that with your other children, do that as a family. Spend time together where you are on a mission to have fun. fun yeah. Have fun together, smile, smile, have fun. Laugh you have to work at that sometimes, you, sometimes you can you get do. overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, very, it's, it's very serious, uh, you're dealing with uh, mental health, but, but there's also a lot of wonderful things in life, you know, as well. And, and I think, you know, sometimes Kate and I just, you know, take a step back. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a small town where, you know, there was a tap weekend and to, to be outdoors and, you know, hear birds chirping, you know, it, it kind of brings you back to, you know, life is good. And uh, yes, we have our challenges, but, you know, everybody, our challenge is our daughter. Everybody has different challenges. That's the one we're dealing with. Uh, but, but there's also wonderful things. We get so you know, encompassed in what's going on with her daughter, sometimes we forget, you know, there's, there's wonderful things out there you know, as well. One other thing I would add too is, is to remember that your loved one is not defined by the symptoms or the diagnosis. 
you, you don't say, I'm bipolar. I have bipolar disorder. You don't, no one that says, I'm cancer. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's, I have cancer. And to recognize that if we look at Peyton and still think, oh my goodness, she is hilarious. She is fun and hilarious and bright and extraordinarily clever. That is who Peyton is. She struggles with, uh, with borderline personality disorder. Like Jim said, we all struggle with our stuff. But to remember that that's a struggle, just like we all have, not the person themselves. It does not define their worldview. What are Peyton's thoughts on, as you've gone public about the story and how her situation's impacted you, how does, what does she say about you guys? What are her thoughts about you? I know for, for me, I think this trickles over us, but I know for me, she, she's proud. I have, um, I have gone on to apply to graduate school and I've gone on to start a women's support group. And both times she has been present with me. I came and introduced herself to the group. She has asked me how my application was going, gave me a big hug, said she was proud. That's really nice. Yeah, I think she's you know, very happy uh, that, that uh, you know, we're doing this event with uh, you know, Medigar, that we've been involved with Medigar. Um, I think she's you know, very happy and excited about that as well. And we have another question from our Facebook viewers. What positive things have you learned about communicating with busy kids? Just some ideas you could give for how you get their attention. be selective with first when it comes to the busy part be selective with your words get in and get out <laughs> <laughs> remember that short attention they're, span. yes they're really yeah. short we have the, I think we, I understood that we have, our attention span is less than that of a goldfish and yeah, something like that's that. frightening <laughs> um, so be mindful about what you want to say be efficient with your words I personally struggle with that but I also think prioritizing what's important. We can all busy our lives with everything from football practice to Netflix. If it's important, it's important. How was school today? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the show 13 Reasons Why. Let's talk about what happened at Lamar High School. And more than anything, wait for the answer. Good yeah. point. How? I, think you have to, I think you have to listen. Uh, we're always so busy. Sometimes you ask the canned question, you know, question, how's your day? Great. How's your <laughs> fine? That sounds How are you normal. doing good? But, but you really want to know. I mean, we're all busy, but if you're going to ask the question, really get the answer. No, how was your day? I know, I know it was good, but what happened? Yeah. Tell me what happened. Well, what was great? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, why why was it good? Let's why talk. was it great? Yeah. Think about how often we say, how are you? Passing someone, we keep walking. Yeah. By the time they can answer, our backs are turned. We haven't even given them an opportunity to answer. And think about how can we say that in a text because that's such a common communication. And I find myself now, if I say, how are you, and something else behind it, and they only answer the second question, then I'll go back. So how are you? Excellent. Yeah. Don't be let that be present. Be present. Are there any last thoughts as we wrap up? Any last thoughts that of advice or encouragement that you would give to other families, and it doesn't have to be with a child, but a loved one, a spouse, a parent, who's dealing with a mental disorder in their family. Any other encouragement or bits of hope that you might leave them with? I say stay strong, uh, and but, but talk to people, be, be open, talk to people, because I found it very therapeutic, uh, talking to people, I talked to somebody yesterday and uh, they had texted when we were, were having some uh, issues with our daughter, and they texted just to see how we were doing. And they said, well, we didn't want to you know, keep texting you. I said, no, you text me whenever you want. I said, for me, that was wonderful. I love hearing that. But um, you'll be able to talk to other people and know that you're not you alone. And you, you know, you, when you talk to people, you find ideas out that I would have never thought of. It helped us kind of formulate you know, our, you know, our plan with, uh, with our daughter We wouldn't have the team we have today if we didn't talk to friends. We wouldn't be married <laughs> if we didn't talk. We also said, not only do you have this, it's a sharing, for, is, is it not only therapeutic to us, you find out more information, and you also have to listen. Yeah. Listen for this. And mental health, it's, it's real. 
it's it's not fully understood yet, but it's a it's a real thing. So don't push it off as uh, that you know they'll they'll snap out of it because they might not snap out of it, and that's not a risk that you want to take. So try to get the help. Chairman Craig, you want to say one more thing? I know that there is a big fear that if we bring it up, we're going to put ideas on our kids' heads. I know that is very real and it's very scary. I would rather them learn about it from me at the kitchen table. I would rather them hear about it and talk about it with me than at school with people they don't know or from someone that wants to sell them drugs just to make it feel better for 10 minutes. So know that if, if you really are if it's one in five people, if it's that prevalent, it's out there, they're going to learn about it, let it be from you. Thank you, thank you so much for the courage you have in telling your story. And we just wish the best for both of you and for Peyton and for your other three children. And there's more help for those of you who are in similar situations. We're out of time now, but if you want more information, on the diagnosis and treatment of mental health disorders, you can go to MenningerClinic.com. And if you need care now for yourself or for a loved one, you can call the Menninger Clinic at 713-275-5400, and they can help direct you to resources for mental health care in the Houston area. Again, that's 713-275-5400. Now, Kate and Jim Likes are hosting the Miniger Annual Luncheon on May 2nd, featuring NFL football player Brandon Marshall, who is diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And proceeds from that will go to mental health research and treatment. Finally, and once again, I would like to thank Jim and Kate for coming today. And your courage is amazing in telling your story, but I think it also helps so many people out there. You may never know all the ripple effect of, of what you've done here today. And, we hope that it makes a wonderful difference in Peyton's life as well. Thank you for joining us. I'm Christy Myers, and I hope you join me for next month's Menninger Clinic Facebook Live. Thank you.